Hoogstein base pairing and its implications. Uh, Carl's Hoogstein discovered the first time a non-canonical non base pairing and this was identified not much long after the Watson and Crick's DNA model was proposed. So therefore, this actually triggered a lot of studies and there were indications that uh, non-canonical base pairing and especially Hoogstein base pairing uh, does have a role to play in the duplex DNA present in cells and therefore there could be some biological implication of the formation of such non-canonical base pairing. So let us look at the learning outcome of the session. So in Watson and Crick's model what was proposed is that generally the bases are present in their most probable tautomeric form and in that most probable tautomeric forms they form base pairs that are able to fit into the double helix. So the shapes, the conformations of the base pair that is formed is typically uh, fitting into the double helical structure of the DNA. And that is the reason why most DNA exist as Watson and Grick, uh, uh, exist in the form where Watson and Grick base pairing is prevalent or is more prevalent than any other non-canonical base pairing but one cannot deny the fact that you, do, you can have non-canonical base pairing as well. So, Hoogstein base pairing is an alternative form of base pairing which extends in fact the structural and the functional aspects of the double helix making the double helix more versatile. So, it has been frequently observed uh, in A-tiered regions. So, it's observed that where you have a stretch of uh, you know A-T's present there are more chances of or there are more probability of having Hoogstein base pairing in such sequences while many studies have revealed that it is less so when it is just GC base pairing. Although as more and more studies are uh, being carried out, uh, these uh, observations seem to be fluctuating between, uh, you know, um, presence in terms of uh, uh, of Hoogstein base pairing in terms of not just the sequence but also the surrounding environment. So the Hoogstein base pairing has been found to be associated with certain biological functions. Now let us compare the Watson and Crick base pair versus the Hoogstein base pairing. Okay. Uh, so what is interesting to note is that in Watson and Crick base pairing, as understood by several studies carried out by, you know, uh, short oligonucleotide studies and carrying out their extra crystallography, NMR studies, etc., it has been found that when the DNA has Watson and Crick base pairing, then both the, uh, you know, purines and the pyrimidines are generally in their anti-conformation. So this anti-conformation is with respect to the spatial arrangement of the base. Uh, around its end glycosidic linkage and you would find that uh, uh, the purine being bulkier the spatial arrangement that is getting affected because of anti and syn is more associated with purines. Nonetheless you can have anti and syn with the pyrimidine as well. So if you look at the AT base pairing okay one would very clearly observe that both the purine and the pyrimidine that is A and the T exist in the anti formation and therefore you have a typical Watson and Crick edge for the nucleobases whether it is the purine or whether it is pyrimidine and this Watson and Crick edge is forming hydrogen bonding. So cast Hugst Hugstein when he was basically studying an oligonucleotide with several AT base pairs the adenine was found to be flipped okay around the end glycosidic linkage okay by a rotation of around 180 degrees and therefore the purine which was earlier in the antiform becomes or comes to what is called as a syn conformation and when the um, base pair or the purine is in the syn conformation you do not have the Watson and Crick edge forming the hydrogen bonding but you now have a new edge which is called as Hoogstein edge thanks to what Hoogstein found is that there is base pairing between the A and T. They are two hydrogen bonds, but the uh, form in which the nucleobase is, is not the same as in the Watson and Crick 
pair, complementary base pair. So what is very clearly observed is that the N7, so okay, in the Watson and Crick, therefore, the one of the hydrogen bonds that is formed is between N1 of the purin and N3 of the pyrimidin. And the other one is between the sixth uh, carbon, uh, the NH2 that is present on the sixth carbon and the, the oxygen that is present in on the fourth carbon of the um, pyrimidin. So, therefore, this becomes the Watson and Crick edge of the nucleobase and this becomes the Watson and Crick edge of this nucleobase. So, you have two hydrogen bonds very typically present. In this case where now you have the purine in the syn conformation, the N1, okay, is no longer facing the pyrimidin. It is facing here. So, what is facing the pyrimidin is now the seventh N. So, the linkage basically or the hydrogen bonding that is formed is typically between N7 of the purine and N3 of the pyrimidin. So, Hoogstin base pairing is always called a hydrogen bonding between the N7 of the purin and the N3 of the pyrimidin. Now, this uh, hydrogen bond remains the same. So, this is common. Although, you may observe that the spatial arrangement of this hydrogen bonding differs from the spatial arrangement of this hydrogen bonding. However, this hydrogen bonding is completely different. Here it is N1, N3 and here it is between N7 and N3. Thus, this kind of base pairing is what is termed as the Hoogstein base pairing. It has been found that the Hoogstein base pairing is having a lower stability compared to that of Watson and Crick. And so, for a stable configuration, for a stable conformation, for a more thermodynamically favorable, favorable structure, one would observe that uh, the duplex will have more and more Watson and Crick base pairing. But what is very evident is that you could have Hoogstein base pairing also possible. Now, therefore, uh, it is important to note that when there is Hoogstein base pairing, because of the syn conformation, okay, the nucleobase is in more closeness or more proximity to the pyrimidine over here. So, the space that is there between the two nucleobases is going to decrease. So, what is therefore going to happen is that the uh, helical radius is going to decrease and also between one sugar and the next sugar, okay, you would find that the distance would decrease. So, isostericity is no longer the same or is not maintained because of the Hoogstein base pairing. So, effectively what is observed is that a DNA that has Hoogstein base pair will have to have its helical, helical uh, diameter constrict by about 2.5 angstrom. So, that is something that is uh, that has been observed by studies carried out by various scientists across. But Hoogstein himself found this uh, very clearly. Now, they also eventually basic, uh, tried to say that the same could happen with a GC base pair as well. In GC base pair also, the guan and purin will have a flip of 180 degrees so that from an anti-confirmation it becomes a syn confirmation and then you have an N7, N3 hydrogen bonding happening rather than an N1, N3 hydrogen bonding. And also what is remarkable is in the Hoogstein base pairing of the GNC, one loses a hydrogen bond as well because of the repositioning of the purine. So this NH2 can no longer form a hydrogen bond with this O. So therefore, the only possible hydrogen bonding is taking place by the Hoogstein face or the Hoogstein edge. Moreover, what has been found is with various studies carried out at different pH, it was found that the feasibility of a GC Hoogstein bearing, base pairing is more when the pH is lowered. So, these are certain observations that have been made with respect to Hoogstein base pairing. Uh, interestingly, what is also observed therefore or what are the characteristics now associated if you have a helix that is completely Hoogstein base paired, that means you have all the base pairing, Hoogstein base pairing and you compare it with of course the normal B DNA which has the Watson and Crick complementary base pairing. So, 
one can compare the two and there are several features that are slightly different or modified from one to the other. So, one of the observations that has been observed is when you look at the helical axis of the two, that is one that has only Hoogstein base pairing and the other that has Watson and Crick, you can look at how the spatial arrangement of the nucleobases differ from the Watson and Crick helix. And so, what is observed is there is a change in the position of the helical axis itself relative to the base space. So, that is something that is very clearly observed. The second thing that has been of course observed is when you compare the helical diameter or you look at the helical radius, you can find that here the radius is lesser. Here too you can find the radius is lesser than when you look at the Watson and Crick helix. So, therefore, definitely the helical radius is decreasing in a helix that is made up of Hoogstein base pairing while when you have a uh, and of course also what is observed is since the base nucleobases may be in a syn conformation the isostericity is also not maintained and therefore the distance between the C1 prime carbon of the two sugars two adjacent sugars will vary this can also have therefore an impact on the base pair stacking. So, another, another possibility and another observation has been therefore that with the Hoogstein base pairing, there is a minor groove and the major groove form, but there would be slight differences now in the environment in the minor and the major groove. So, what is observed is there is altered hydrogen bonding donor acceptor pattern and because there is altered hydrogen bonding donor acceptor uh, uh, pattern, uh, it is found that the minor groove in the Hoogstein base pairing has a narrower and less electronegative minor groove. Okay, now that is definitely going to influence the way a protein interacts. So, therefore, such Hoogstein base pair regions in a B DNA may be a site at which a protein can specifically come and bind. So, this is an implication that is observed with the Hoogstein base pairing. Now, distinct, therefore, as mentioned earlier, there can be distinct helix stacking and also the hydration patterns vary because it is very clearly noted that when a Hoogstein base pairing is formed, you have water being removed. And because you have more water being removed, the overall hydration will be with relation to a Watson and Crick helix be different in, in a, a Hoogstein helix. Okay, so these are certain characteristics that are associated with the Hoogstein base pair helix that is formed. Now, when uh, Rich and his colleagues studied an oligonucleotide which had a repeating pattern of CG, TA and GC, it was observed basically they were ba trying to look at the uh, you know mode of action of triostin A, triostin A being a peptide antibiotic and being used as an anti-tumor agent. They basically were trying to understand how is it that the triostin A is going to help as an anti-tumor agent or what is its mode of action. So interestingly what has been observed is that the triostin A can intercalate within the uh, you know DNA the uh, double helix and a uh, specific interaction of the triostin A has been found to be at regions where there is an alternate GC CG uh, you know base pairing. So you can see in this structure how wherever there is a GC CG okay base pairing you would find that the triostin A comes and binds to or intercalates within that region. Now when it intercalates at this region the complementary base pairing, Watson and Crick base pairing here is not really affected. So, this remains a Watson and Crick base pairing. But, interestingly, the adjacent base pairs, whether it is this CG or it is this ATTA, these are getting affected and flipping of the, nu of the nucleobase, which is a purine, has been observed from an anti-confirmation to cis-syn confirmation. And that immediately leads to formation of Hoogstein base pairing. So, you will find that here there is Hoogstein base pairing, here there is Hoogstein base pairing, here there is Hoogstein base pairing, while here you have what is called as the Watson and Crick base pairing itself. So, as mentioned, this over here and here you have typical Hoogstein base pairing. So, from the top view, when you see that, you can see that the C cytosine 
is only having three two hydrogen bonds with the purine over here but look at the adjacent gc the gray is the adjacent gc there you can find three hydrogen bonds being formed so when it comes to uh, this getting into the set conformation you will immediately see that this cg has only two hydrogen bonds okay while this cg has a triple or three hydrogen bonds so the and the only difference being that within this gc and this cg is present the triostin a but the presence of the triostin a has changed the conformation of this cg base pair which has become a hookstein base pair the same has been observed with the at as well so when you compare it with the cg over here and the at over here you will find that the cg will have watson and crick but the at changes into hookstein base pairing so the idea is that when you have the triostin a bound to the oligonucleotide it is observed that the watson and crick base pairs coexist with the hookstein base pair and this coexistence is actually stabilizing the overall structure of the oligonucleotide so basically the implications of hookstein base pairing is that when there is something that interacts with the dna the hookstein base pairing helps in maintaining the overall structure of the dna even if it has a lower stability compared to the watson and crick uh, base pairing so this is something that is very interesting uh, to be observed now therefore from the earlier study by rich and colleagues and they took forward with many other work they found that the dna protein complex wherever the many places where there is dna protein complex the dna seems to have certain sequences which exist in the hookstein base pairing so therefore there was a kind of understanding that certain proteins may be binding specifically to the hookstein base pair in the bdna or they may be present or they or their interaction with the bdna may lead to formation of hookstein base pair stabilizing the interaction between the dna and the protein now several studies with different dna binding proteins were carried out uh, one of the a few of the examples which we will look over here so for example the p53 tumor suppressor protein when it binds to the dna it was observed that the region where the a uh, p53 binds at that position a ta80 got converted into a hookstein base pair so therefore it was kind of understood that the p53 binding to the dna was stabilized by formation of a hookstein base pair over here and that also implicated into what we call as the change in the structure of the helix at that point where there is hookstein base pairing when you compare to this when you compare this region with this region you can see that the helix is constricted over here the diameter is less over here so these are certain things that are very clearly observed uh, another study was carried out with uh, a dna that had a tata box and but the tata box had mutation so when the tata box binding protein was found to bind to the mutated tata box it was observed that the tata binding protein may not directly bind to the uh, gc over here but it may be directly binding to the at region over here but on binding of the tata box binding protein to the at rich region showed that the adjacent gc over here whether it is here or here were getting converted into hookstein base pairing so you can very clearly see that you would have two hydrogen bonds between the cg and gc over here so it means that the binding of the protein to this region has brought about a change in the conformation in the dna just adjacent to the protein binding region so these are certain important facets that has been observed structural aspects and the functionality of this probably is being that the dna protein interaction is increased because of hookstein base pairing formed temporarily so when the dna when the dna binding protein is removed from that the hookstein base pairs can again go back to watson and crick base pairs now dna damages and hookstein base pairing have again a important correlation so let's say for example consider a study that was carried out where an adenine is methylated so a methylated adenine was actually observed to form a hookstein base pair with thymine 
So where earlier the adenine would have formed a Watson and Crick base pair with thymine, when a methyl group is added to the adenine, this methylated adenine no longer exists as a Watson and Crick base pair, but now it forms a Hoogstein base pair. And that has been referred to because suppose you have the methyl group present over here and substituted at this end. Now you can never have a hydrogen bonding between the one end and the N3 of the. So you know that over here when you have an AT base pairing and it is a Watson and Crick base pairing, you have the N1 of the adenine in a hydrogen bond with the N3 of the thymine. But if there is a methyl group at the N1, the methyl group being non-polar will never form a hydrogen bond with the N3 group. So what is going to happen? This purine is going to flip and convert it into syn form. And when it converts into the syn form, the 7N is now going to hydrogen bond with the N3. So this basically is forming the Hoogstein base pair. So you can see how when the adenine is methylated, the, the base pairing has changed. And because the base pairing has changed, you know that the helical radius is going to decrease. You know that the helix at this point is going to be constricted. And so during repair, many of the molecules of the repair may identify damaged bases or damaged regions of the, of the DNA with respect to looking at the fact that whether the helical region is constricted. And also, because the bonding is relatively low, uh, you know, stable, lower stability than the Watson and Crick, it may be so that the flipping, one, the flipping has happened. So they are actually able to recognize this anti from the sin. That is one. They're able to recognize that the helical uh, radius has decreased. They may be able to uh, associate the fact that isostericity over here has changed. So all these are points of you know, recognition of a particular protein to a particular stretch of DNA. So therefore, and also one is one important facet that has been observed with a lot of DNA repair mechanisms is that if it is not the normal base, if it is an abnormal base, then the abnormal base is flipped out so that the base enters the active site and then you have the catalytic action of the DNA repair system happening. So in fact, the flipping of the bases may also be more possible when it is a Hoogstein base pairing than when it is a Watson and Crick base pairing. Also significantly because of the Hoogstein base pairing, the minor groove environment changes and because the minor groove environment changes, it becomes more conducible for certain proteins to come and bind at the damaged region. So these are implications of how Hoogstein base pairing in the BDNA itself can enable a certain functionality. What is the functionality over here? The functionality is that the DNA repair system can actually identify where the repair has to take place. Now, one another interesting phase facet that is associated with Hoogstein base pairing is a triple helix formation. That means the triplex formation. So, interestingly, what is observed is that a third strand of DNA can come in binding, bind to an existing Watson and Crick duplex. So what you observe over here is an anti-parallel, two anti-parallel strands forming hydrogen bonding, which is in the Watson and Crick form. But through the major groove of this, uh, you know, DNA duplex, a third strand could come and form Hoogstein base pairing with that to typically form at this portion, a triple helix. So, interesting to observe is that when Hoogstein base pairing is formed, there is a removal of water molecule. And so, at the triplex region, what is going to also happen is that the hydration pattern is going to change. So, uh, suppose you have the duplex antiparallel, and then the third complex, or the sorry, the third strand that comes and binds is parallel to one of the strands. So, when it is parallel to one of the strands, one typically finds what is called a CGC or a TAT, you know, that kind of an interaction happening. So, when over here you have two hydrogen bonds forming, here you will have a typical Watson and Crick. So, in this neuro, neuro base, this is the Watson, uh, this is the Hoogstein edge and this is the Watson and Crick edge. So, the Watson and Crick edge edge forms the Watson and uh, Crick base pairing while the Hoogstein phase forms 
a hookstein base pairing with the uh, you know c so another important fact is over here is when you look at the hookstein base pairing this non canonical base pairing is a hetero you know it's a hetero uh, non canonical base pairing and the other can you can also see that you can have a third strand coming and binding in such a way that it is anti parallel to the strand that it is binding in such a scenario what has been observed is there are more likelihood of a homopurine interaction happening rather than a heteropurine interaction happening or a heteropyridine interaction happening so these are certain interesting facts that have been observed with respect to the triple helix uh significantly what has been found is that regions in the bdna where you have more of pyrimidines or it is rich in pyrimidines or uh, rich in purines there there is more likelihood of formation of a stable triple helix so are there any implications of the triple helix formation but obvious any structural aspect or any structural change in the dna will definitely relate to some kind of a biological function so what is observed is that the binding of the third strand may be a way of editing the dna so for example the third strand can come and specifically bind to a specific region in the dna and when it comes and binds and identifies a specific region uh, the enzymes that can actually edit or cut the dna will come and cut the dna only at that specific site so genome editing can be aided by using the third strand so you can actually design the third strand as well and choose to target a particular gene where you want to cut where you want to carry out some kind of editing so this is something that has a good implication or a therapeutic implication uh, per se another therapeutic implication is if you would like to block the transcription of a specific gene and such a therapeutic uh, uh you know uh, focus is what is also called as antigen therapy but of course with antigen therapy there is an issue what is the issue that a triplex that is formed is always having a lower stability so to increase the stability many scientists across the world have used the third strand with either an intercalating agent or with you know compounds like peg etc and these peg or intercalators have been found to uh make the triplex more stable while it lasts and so therefore whatever therapy or whatever therapeutic has to be considered even when you want an editing enzyme to go and bind if the triplex is there for longer period of time the efficacy by which the enzyme is going to function is going to be greater so such studies have ensured that wherever a triplex is formed there you have uh, you know uh, uh, you uh, you uh, you can have that as a site of any kind of change or you can have that as a site of a protein coming and binding so these are certain implications that are associated with hookstein base pairing and triple helix therefore is an interesting phenomenon that is associated with the dna dna molecule so let us come to the conclusions in a double helix on flipping of a purine to its syn syn form can lead to formation of hookstein base pairing hookstein base pairing definitely leads to a change in the helical axis the minor and major groove environments the construction of the helix etc so you can see very clearly there are several structural features of dna that change when the base pairing moves from watson and crick base pairing to hookstein base pairing dna is can on interacting with other organic compounds or say for example even proteins then you could have formation of hookstein base pairing or it could be the other way around that is wherever there is hookstein base pairing a, a protein dna binding protein can come and bind at that specific region so that gives rise to a functional aspect a third oligonucleotide is able to bind to a double helix through hookstein base pairing forming a triple helical structure and just mentioned as just mentioned this can have a plausible role to play So Hookstein base pairing was an interesting structural phenomenon observed not long after the Watson and Crick DNA model was proposed opening up the possibilities of structural changes within base pairs due to different conformations of sugars nucleotides and environmental conditions thank you